Hello, I'm Dave Hebel, Manager of Technical Services at Arc Specialties. In this presentation, I'm going to cover the electro slag strip welding process, how it works, the equipment used, and what you can expect in the way of deposition rates and weld metal chemistries. We'll spend most of our time in the shop, so this will be as close as we can get to a hands-on session. As an introduction, there are two types of strip welding processes for corrosion resistant overlays. There's submerged arc welding and electro slag welding. The equipment and the strip are the same for both processes. The main difference is the welding flux. The electro slag strip comes in widths of 30, 60, 90, and 120 millimeters and is one half millimeter thick. The 30 and 60 millimeter strips are the most common sizes that I've worked with. For the wider 90 and 120 millimeter strip, a magnetic steering device is usually required to control the weld pool at the higher currents. As I mentioned earlier, the big difference is the welding flux. Electro slag fluxes have a higher electrical conductivity when in the molten state. The other difference is the welding voltage. The submerged arc process operates at 28 to 30 volts, while the electro slag process operates at 24 volts. Here we see the wire feed motor with the wire bus bar removed and the strip welding head installed. With submerged arc welding, there is an arc at the end of the strip, just like there is when welding with a wire. This means we need to have flux on both sides of the strip to cover the arc that is operating at 28 to 30 volts. As I stated earlier, with the electro slag process, the flux has a higher electrical conductivity when it is in the molten state. The welding voltage is going to be much lower, down in the 24 volt range, and there is no arc. You will see there is no arc when we look at the close-up video while welding. The resistive heating of the strip melts the strip, the flux, and some of the base metal. Because there is no arc, we only need to have flux on the front side of the strip. The molten slag shields the molten weld pool from the atmosphere on the back side of the strip. When we compare the two processes, electro slag welding has about 30% higher deposition rates and 30% higher travel speeds than with submerged arc welding. Because there's no arc, we have less dilution and many times we can meet chemistry in one pass versus two passes with submerged arc welding. High-speed fluxes are available that allow you to travel twice as fast with a thinner weld layer deposit. There are limitations to both processes. With the high currents associated with the wider strips, the base metal needs to be thick enough to handle the heat. As the strip width increases, the welding current increases, and so does the base metal thickness requirements. Here we have the minimum plate thickness requirements for the different strip widths. Let's take a look at the setup for making a 625 corrosion resistant overlay using a 30 millimeter strip. We will run a 30 millimeter stick out with a 30 millimeter flux depth. <clears throat> Our welding parameters will be 575 amps, 24 volts at 16 centimeters per minute travel speed with a step over of one inch or 25 millimeters. This should give us a deposit of five to six millimeters thick and a weld chemistry with less than 10% iron in the first layer. Our deposition rate will be 25 pounds per hour. 
Weld chemistry can be controlled by changing the travel speed. If we go faster, the penetration increases and the weld deposit gets thinner. So we have more base metal dilution. If we slow down, the penetration decreases as the deposit becomes thicker and we have less base metal dilution. We can also control chemistry with the welding current. As the current increases, we deposit more weld metal, decreasing base metal dilution. Reducing the current makes a thinner deposit, so we will have more base metal dilution. Our 30 millimeter stick out is measured between the contact jaws and the base metal. The edge of the strip should overlap the previous weld bead by six millimeters. For improved starting, we cut the strip at an angle, so we're starting with a fine point on the strip. Another improvement is using a programmed hot start. I like to program a start of about 28 volts for three seconds, followed by 26 volts for three seconds, and then dropping to the 24 volts for the remainder of the weld. The higher starting voltage helps us get the molten slag and weld pool started. The flex depth is 30 millimeters, so it should be the same height as the contact jaw. When making short welds on a test plate, I don't use the flux hopper and flux funnel. I just pour the flux directly on the plate, as you'll see in my photos and videos. To start, we need to enter the welding parameters into the welding control. We'll run 148 centimeters per minute strip speed, 24 volts, at 16 centimeters per minute travel speed. With these parameters, we should have about 570 to 580 amps. Here we see the strip head and feed motor pulling the strip off the coil. The welding action should be smooth with an occasional pop. You'll notice that the strip pushes the flux out of the way in front of the strip with some of it flowing around the sides of the strip. The center of the weld should have the molten slag exposed on the surface, and the slag should be self-peeling as it cools. The surface should be smooth and free of porosity. Here we see the first layer of our weld test plate. The flat weld surface is a big cost savers when it comes to machining because we have fewer intermittent cuts. Next, let's weld with a 60 millimeter strip. We will be welding with a 309L strip with a 30 millimeter stick out and a 30 millimeter flux depth. The amperage is going to be 1150 amps, 24 volts at 18 centimeters per minute travel speed. The step over distance with a 60 millimeter strip should be two inches or 50 millimeters between passes. This will give us a five to six millimeter thick deposit with a chemistry of 20% chrome and 12% nickel in the first layer. Our deposition rate is 50 pounds per hour. Here we're welding with a 60 millimeter strip. Once again, we see the bright molten slag on top of the weld pool. As we move closer, you can see the strip feeding through the contact jaws with some of the flux flowing around the edges of the strip. As you look closer, you can see there is no arc on the strip. We're just seeing the bright light from the molten slag. We have a large molten pool, so we need to have a crater fill at the end of the weld. I use about two or three seconds. 
and that's usually enough to fill the large pool. Once again, the slag should be self-peeling as it cools. When we turn the slag over, it should be smooth and free of porosity. Here we see our two inch or 50 millimeter step over between weld passes. Our finished weld is about six millimeters thick with a chemistry of 20 chrome and 12 nickel in the first layer. All of our welds so far have been on flat plates, so let's move on to circumferential welds. When cladding pressure vessels or pipe, the off-center distance is critical to the weld chemistry and base metal fusion. Moving the weld head uphill or downhill from the center line will have a big effect on the dilution of the base metal and the weld chemistry. For circumferential welds, a small X-ray diffraction analyzer or PMI gun is very useful for checking the weld chemistry and positioning of the weld head during production. Both welding processes have large weld pools. Molten metal and molten slag still run downhill, so we need to keep the weld pool on a flat plate or near the center line of a round vessel or pipe. We can make circumferential welds on the inside or outside as long as we keep the weld pool small enough that it won't run off the surface. These are the approximate minimum diameters for making circumferential welds on the inside and outside of vessels. Let's look at this drawing with the pipe rotating in the clockwise direction. If we are welding on the outside before top dead center, we're welding downhill, riding the weld pool, so penetration is going to decrease. This will cause our weld chemistry to increase. Using our stainless steel example, our chrome and nickel will increase. If we're welding on the outside after top dead center, we're welding uphill on the leading edge of the weld pool, so the penetration is going to increase and our weld chemistry, chrome and nickel, will decrease. When we're welding on the inside with the welding head after the bottom center, we are welding on the downhill side, so penetration is going to decrease, causing our weld chemistry, chrome and nickel, to increase. If we're welding on the inside and the weld head is before the center of rotation, we're welding uphill, so penetration increases with our weld chemistry, chrome and nickel decreasing. So now that I've confused everyone, let's make a weld. Here we're welding on the outside of a 32 inch pipe with a 30 millimeter 625 Inconel strip. As the pipe rotates, the unused flux falls off the pipe and into a flux pan for recovery and recycling. The solidified slag is self-peeling and falls off by itself. As an experiment, we made a weld on the inside of this pipe with the weld head bottom dead center and had an iron content of 10%. Moving the head one inch ahead of the center of rotation increased the iron content to 20%. Moving the weld head one inch after the center of rotation reduced our iron content to 5%. The off-center distance is a critical variable when making circumferential welds. It's a balance between weld chemistry and weld penetration. 
I get nervous when the chemistry goes below 5% in a single layer on small diameters. You can't risk the lack of fusion between the weld overlay and the base metal, and that's controlled by our off-center distance. You don't have to be off by much to be out of chemistry spec. Here we see the weld step over on our pipe weld. Depending on the equipment used, you can use a continuous weld spiral or a step over. For 30 millimeter strip, the step over should be one inch or 25 millimeters. When we cut our weld in the longitudinal direction, the fusion line should be straight with a five to six millimeter deposit thickness. Obviously, this is on a flat plate. The weld cross section across the ends of the weld beads will usually have a small ripple where the weld beads overlap, but it's only about one millimeter. During our setup, I showed a six millimeter overlap of the strip on the previous weld bead. If the overlap is less than six millimeters, you will have more ripple on the weld surface. If you have never seen the electroslag process before, I hope that I was able to stimulate your interest in learning more about the process and its applications. If you think you might have an application for electroslag strip welding, let's start a conversation. If you have any questions, please send me an email and thanks for tuning in.